Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are in the book of Job. We come today to Job chapter 12, beginning our study in verse number 1. So get your Bible, open it up to the Old Testament book of Job, which is right before Psalms, and we'll begin in just a minute. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And you can study the Bible from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages, just like we're going to do today. That's at the Bibleversebyverse.com. But there you can click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, study at your pace, at your convenience. Three complete series going through the Bible at the Bibleversebyverse.com. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Job chapter 12, verse 1, And Job answered and said, No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. Job says, Yes, you guys know everything, don't you? He's talking to his three miserable, rotten, judgmental friends. And he says, facetiously, of course, Once you die, no one will be here to show us how to live we, we all depend on you so much. And I'm sure that they know that he is being sarcastic. Verse 3, But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not such things as thee? And that's true. Um, everything that they've been saying is common knowledge, if you have a half a spiritual brain. But they were using their pious, pious platitudes to attack Job as if he was not living up to the word of God. So what they were saying, for the most part, was true. It just didn't have anything to do with him and his suffering, even though they were implying that it did. But what Job is saying is, you know, I've got a mind also. And it doesn't take a a spiritual genius to understand that the pious statements that you guys are making are true, at least many of them. Verse 4, I am as one mocked of his neighbor, who calleth upon God, and he answereth him. The just, upright man is laughed to scorn. People were ridiculing Job. They were saying, look at the man who had a reputation for for praying. Look at the man who talked with God. Look at the holy man and how he suffers. And of course, Satan is enjoying it all very much because it is casting reproach upon God. Well, this is what you get for serving God. This is a holy man who is devoted to God. This is what your God does to you. Well, the story is not over. Verse 5, he that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. In other words, it's easy for people who have it made, who have it really nice, to accuse those who suffer of wrongdoing. Verse 6, The tabernacles of robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure, into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. The world is full of injustice, The world is filled with bad people who have it made in this life. But what Job failed to add is that that's not going to last for them. Seven, but ask now the beast, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. It is possible to learn spiritual lessons from observing nature, and animals. God has many types of classrooms, you know that? The world is filled with them, that everything of you, just look around and you have a heart for God, God will speak to you and he'll teach you things about himself. Nine, who knoweth not all these things, that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? Nature understands that God is sovereign. 
Nature understand that God controls all things. They're just all on automatic pilot. God's driving. And they don't put up a fuss. They just play the hand that they've been dwelt, dealt, whether it's a bird or an animal or, you know, trees, whatever. It's just, they just are. And they just go by whatever God does. And that's it. God is sovereign. But what he is to them, he is to us too. Verse 10, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Just think of that. It is God who controls our life. God made us. Life belongs to him. Our life belongs to him. And he can do with it whatever he wants to. And if he chooses to end it in this material world, he can do that. He, that's his business. You have no right to complain. And neither do I. God has our very life in his hand because it belongs to him. Our days belong to him. Our life belongs to him. The duration of our life belongs to him. It's all up to him. So, in light of that, don't you think it's a real good idea for us to have a holy respect for God, each one of us? And we sin. And if we're Christians, we hate it. But we should confess it right away. Lord, I'm sorry for wasting time doing wrong when I could have been doing good. I'm sorry for the specific sins that I've committed. And he will forgive you and you can have a fresh start. But that's a smart thing to do. I mean, we need to have that holy respect for God since our life is in his hands. Verse 11, Doth not the ear try words and the mouth taste his meat? Job is saying, I want you to give me a fair hearing. In other words, judge the words that I'm about to speak impartially. Just like you judge the taste of food. Judge what I'm about to say impartially. And that's the least we can do for anyone. Listen to their words. Measure those words by scripture. If they're off kilter from the word of God, gently correct them. If they're on target, accept them. The Bible says we are to try all things. We're to test all things. Verse 12. With the ancient is wisdom, and in length of days understanding. Bildad was correct when he said wisdom comes with age. But even the wisdom of the elderly, elderly is flawed sometimes. No matter how old you get, you're still going to have some flaws in your wisdom. That's why even what the elderly say, those who've been around a long time, who've, who've got a lot of experience, their words must be measured by the Word of God as well. Verse 11. Doth not the ear try words and the mouth taste meat? Verse 13, 12. With the ancient is wisdom, and in the length of days is understanding. God is the one, the only one, who has flawless wisdom. And so we learn how to live, and we, we learn what's really important by listening to him. And that's why everybody, no matter what your age is, should be in the Word of God, should be studying the Word of God. We always have to stay in contact with Almighty God, our Creator, and the one who the Bible says is filled with all the treasuries of wisdom and knowledge. You want to tap into that, you got to spend time with them. Verse 14, Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. When God decrees that something should break, no one will be able to fix it. If God wants something or someone locked into a certain situation, they're not going to get out. That's why when we pray, we need to pray with the understanding that God is sovereign. 
And it is true that God says you have not because you ask not. There are certain things that God will only do if we pray for them. But there are other things that God will not do no matter how hard we pray for them. He locks us into certain situations where there's no biblical way to get out and we're stuck and we must be stuck in those times and take the bad from God as well as the good and trust that he knows what he's doing. And that's where living by faith really becomes a challenge. 15. Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. Also he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. Both of those things are true. If there's a drought, it's because God is holding back water. If there's a flood, it's because God released the water. 16. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. Strength and success both come from God. And this is why we need to pray for strength and we need to pray for success. Don't take these things for granted. Pray for strength to do what he wants you to do and pray for success in doing it. Verse 17. He leadeth counselors away spoiled and maketh the judges fools. God can, if he chooses to, put ridiculous ideas in a so-called wise person's mind. He can twist his thinking. He can twist his counsel. And he can make it work against them. More reason to have a holy respect and fear for God and make sure that you're walking with him and make sure that you're pleasing him and make sure you're getting your, your wisdom and your direction from the word of God. See, people, people who disregard the word of God or maybe give lip service, as in the case of many Christian counselors, so-called, give lip service to the word of God, sprinkle it upon their counsel just for taste. But really, the principles that guide them have nothing to do with the word of God in many cases. And they will ultimately fail, and they do fail. Get your wisdom from the word of God. Stick to the book, and God will lead you. 18. He looseth the bond of kings and girdeth their loins with a girdle or with a belt. He girds their loins with a belt. No one is too important, too powerful for God to replace if it suits his purpose. 20. <clears throat> Actually, verse 19. He leadeth the princes away spoiled and overthroweth the mighty. God can replace anyone. He can, and he can replace anything. He can replace a king's royal garment with rags if he chooses to. And you look in the Old Testament, that's what he did to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, the leader of the world's superpower, the most powerful man in the world, was so arrogant, so puffed up with pride that God knocked him down to size. And he ended up dis, 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 uh, um, he ended up, I can't think of the word. He ended up having to remove his royal clothing. How's that? And he lived like an animal for seven lousy, miserable years. So God is able to, no one is too powerful for God to humble. No one is too important. No one is too powerful for God to humble, to replace if it suits his purpose. These are all reasons to stay close to God. You're not that big of a deal, okay? Jesus didn't die on the cross to pay for your sins because you are a big deal. He died on the cross to pay for your sins because he loved you even though you're not, on, even though you're not lovable. And that's the truth. 
You say, well, now that just doesn't make me feel too good. You're attacking my self-esteem. Good, because there's nothing in you to esteem. And the sooner you get that into your noggin, the better off you'll be. Give God the glory. Dying on the cross was his idea. <clears throat> Paying for your sins was solely, completely, and totally because he, un because he loved the unlovable. He died for the unworthy. You see, this is, this is an area where many modern Christian counselors have left the Word of God, and they try to build up Christian self-esteem by saying, look how wonderful you are. Look how valuable you are that Jesus came and died on the cross for you. Those dirty, rotten rats, they completely destroy the grace of God. Jesus didn't die for us because we're wonderful. He died for us. Because he loves the unlovable. It's all about his grace. It has nothing to do with us at all. Nothing. And it should make us love him all the more. And serve him out of love and appreciation. That's why we have to stick to the books. We don't get messed up when it comes to things like this. And then you get in trouble. And believe me, they will be in trouble on Judgment Day. You say, well, they didn't know any better. They just studied that stuff from you know, their college and, you know, all this other stuff. Their seminaries, unfortunately. <clears throat> yeah, well, they should have studied the Word of God. Look at verse 20. He removeth away the speech of the trusty and taketh away the understanding of the aged. God is able to keep those who have a lot of wisdom silent. And he can cause those who people look to for advice to be nothing more than empty-headed fools. I'm telling you, we better understand how much we rely on God, how much we need to rely on Him. He is the source of every good thing that we have and any good thing that we can do. Notice verse 21. He poureth contempt upon princes and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. God can make famous people contemptible. He can take away the strength of the strong. Verse 22. He, verse, verse 22 says, He uncovers deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. He uncovers the deep things out of darkness. God knows the secret thoughts of everyone. He knows what makes you tick. Other people can see what you do, but God knows why you do it. You know, I, I really don't like to be around salesman type. Not, I'm, not, I'm not degrading every salesman. There are some good salesmen who are honest. I'm talking about salesman type who specialize in flattery and talk and talk and talk and say the right thing and they know the right thing to say to get you to think what you want them to think. And they come across as being so nice, but you stick around them for a while. You hang around them for, the, for a while and their true nature will come out. Flattery. Lies. God not only sees what we do and hears what we say, He knows what's behind those actions and thoughts. It takes us a little while to figure it out sometimes, but God knows. And people like that are contemptible to Him. Verse 23 He increaseth <clears throat> the nations and destroyeth them. He enlargeth the nations and straight, straighteneth them again. So, in other words, he enlarges, he restricts, he strengthens, he brings down. God is in control. In control. What is true for kings and people in general is true for nations as well. 
God is the one who increases a nation or diminishes them according to his will. And you know what the Bible says? <clears throat> the Bible says, blessed are the people whose, whose nation, whose God is the Lord. Verse 24, he taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way. God is able to take all reason away from world leaders, from those that people look to for guidance. And you see, his point here, Job's point is, God is the one who's in charge. And everybody needs to submit to him. And everybody should have a good, healthy fear. Not just an awe of God. When the Bible talks about fearing God, yes, it includes being in awe of him, but it also means fear. Fear, afraid, respect, knowing that he's in control, knowing that he has your life and your wisdom and your skills and your words and your thoughts and everything else in his hands, and he can confuse them all. He can scramble them all and make them all useless. So again, verses 24 and 25, he taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way. They grope in the dark without light and he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. The Lord can make rulers grope around in a mental darkness without a clue as to what to do. Let's go on to chapter 13. we got a few minutes left. Lo, mine eye hath seen all this. Mine ear hath heard and understood it. Verse 2, what ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior to you. Job's friends have made a lot of true statements, but they have not told Job anything that he doesn't already know. And sadly, they haven't said anything to help him either in all of his suffering. Because pious platitudes don't do anyone any good when they're hurting. Verse 3, Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. Job is tired of going around in circles with his pathetic friends. He'd like to talk with God straight up. Verse 4, But ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. They were worthless doctors because they did not understand the source of Job's problems and they didn't treat it with biblical advice. They misdiagnosed Job's problem, so they had no solution either. If you don't understand what something is, you're not going to find the right solution. Now, if Job's problem was sin, if he had truly done something wrong, then they would have been right to approach him and to confront him in love and to expose his sin so that he would repent and get right with God. But they had no evidence, and in fact there was no evidence that Job committed any sin that brought about all this trouble he was having. And so when they attacked him as a moral reprobate, they weren't doing him any good because they were wrong in their diagnosis. And this is, this is so true. The opposite is true too. Today, there are so many people that refuse to call sin, sin. In modern evangelicalism, they'll call it sickness, they'll call it disease, they'll call it dysfunction. They treat it as if it's a, a sickness. And they try to cure, they try to heal the person. You don't heal people of sin. People have to repent of this. They have to be confronted. You have to diagnose it correctly according to the Word of God. And then they can get over it. And then they can, And then God can deliver them. But they have to know that what they're doing is sinful so that they repent. You don't repent of a sickness, but you repent of sin. And you cry out to God for mercy and forgiveness and you ask him for help and you get in the word of God because that's how you're sanctified. And that's how sin becomes less of an influence in you. Then you do it God's way and he delivers you. 
And these guys were worthless doctors. His friends were worthless doctors because they didn't know what the problem was. They didn't measure Job's situation by the word of God, so they were useless. They had no answers. If we don't measure things by the word of God and conform things to the word of God, then we're going to be useless to God. Verse 5, oh, that he would altogether hold peace, hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. So Job, he's saying the wisest thing you guys could possibly do is just shut up. Because you're not doing me any favors and you're just building up wrath for the day of wrath too. And that was true. Both those things were true. Six, hear now my reasoning and hearken to the pleadings of my lips. Will ye speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? Telling someone who is suffering that God is punishing them is like, is in fact telling a lie in God's name. A person better be very careful about saying God is doing this or that when they don't know for a fact that God is doing this or that. Eight, will ye accept his person? Will ye contend for God? In other words, you three are defending God for pelting me with all this trouble. You're acting like you're his lawyer. Nine, is it good that he should search you out? Or as one man mocketh another, do ye so mock him? In other words, God will judge you for misrepresenting him. Not only misrepresenting Job, but misrepresenting God. Saying that God was punishing Job when he wasn't. Got to be careful of what we say in God's name, what we say about God. Got to be careful with those words, thus saith the Lord, that I hear thrown around so glibly today in some circles. Some of the most ridiculous things in the world are said after someone piously says, God told me. And then they come up with something ridiculous. And all it is is the imagination of their own heart. Let me tell you something. You're going to answer for those idle words. God doesn't appreciate you putting words in his mouth, especially ridiculous, stupid things that, that lead to all sorts of trouble. And I've seen it happen a lot of times to a lot of people. I've seen lives destroyed, totally ruined, marriages ruined, families destroyed, completely disrupted because somebody in the family was running around saying, God told me, God told me, we're supposed to do this, God showed me, and nothing, it was nothing but the imagination of their own hearts. And it ruined them, and it ruined their family. Well, I think we'll stop right there. We'll pick it up in verse 8 next time. Meanwhile, you can continue studying the Word of God at the thebibleversebyverse.com. Remember, go there, click on the series. There's three complete series going through the Bible, 30 years of archive teaching. Click on the series you want to study. Go through the whole Bible, Genesis through Revelation, all 66 books of the Bible in order, which is what I recommend. Start in Genesis, go all the way through Revelation. I recommend that, but you don't have to do that. Do as the Lord may lead. Study any book of the Bible you want to study, any chapter within those books at thebibleversebyverse.com. And it's all there for you. All you need to do is bring your open Bible. Click and listen at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember, if the Word of God is a blessing to you, that we are not underwritten by a large church or denomination. For over 30 years, this has been a faith ministry, which means that I depend on listeners who love God's Word to support this ministry with their prayers and their financial support. So please, please pray for God's Word to be blessed, that souls would be saved and the saved would be sanctified. Please, ble- please pray that God's Word would spread and be honored. And if the Lord leads, click that donate button at the top of the front page and give us the Lord may lead. Prayerfully, of course, give us the Lord may lead. Stand shoulder to shoulder with me and help me to get out the Word of God. Be a partner with this ministry with me, getting out God's Word. God will bless you if you study His Word. He'll bless you. Be a part of this ministry. 
Study the Word of God, whatever you do. Study God's Word. Until next time, this is Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.